Jackson Swain touchdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for the Swain event with your host, Jason Swain. My man. Real sports talk for the real sports fan. All you chumps are going to bow when I whoop him. It's time for the Swain event, fueled by Dead End Barbecue. Get it to his house and a red flag. <laughs> Swainevents.com, fueled by Denny and Barbecue. We're talking about the barbecue restaurant in America, 865-255-03. I'm Dexter Swain, live from the Low T Central Studio. My man Ben McKee, Go Balls 247. Back off the road from Charlotte for a few hours before, before hitting the road again to Detroit. Watch Tennessee take on Creighton, the number three seed, for a chance to go to the Elite Eight. It is the Sweet 16. Only 16 teams to say they have an opportunity to go win a championship. Tennessee's one of those teams. Ben McKee, good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good, man. I'm good. Um, question. How do you celebrate a dog's birthday? Do you celebrate a dog's birthday? Yes, what do you do? Uh, we we do celebrate our dog Judge and his birthday when it when it pops up. Uh, we typically show him a lot of loving, and we buy him a couple of treats from the store and uh, give him those treats. That that's typically how we celebrate by showing him some love and giving him some extra treats. You put like a birthday hat on him or something. No, nah, we don't do all that. He he wouldn't he wouldn't let us keep that on him. Okay, I, I'm just I was just wondering, man. I'm just wondering. La- last year, um, I think we were out of town or something, and it was Ace's birthday, so he was like he was he was boarded, and then this year we're here. Today is the Ace Man's birthday, and so my uh, birthday, Ace. Just wondering what do with him so just just wonder man just, just well, wonder the, the good news is that uh you have four females in your house and i'm sure uh at least one of them if not the brain trust of all four of them combined will handle that business for you yeah they um they didn't know until i woke up this morning and told them that it was ace's birthday then they, they popped up it was all excited and so mm-hmm. um we'll we'll handle it I guess today and get him some good treats or whatever and celebrate his birthday. All right, just wanted to know that. You all you dog, all you dog good good lovers luck. and owners out there, if y'all celebrate y'all's birthday, dog's birthday differently, let, let me know, man. Uh, the text box, Baby Chevrolet text box, open for you on the free Swain event app, Android app devices. Simply go there and submit your comment, a question, and I love to read it throughout the show. Uh, being I was um, not happy uh, after the SEC tournament showing, uh, my confidence was was low with how we played. Uh, I think the guys played with the hair on fire versus St. Peter's, uh, despite the lack of competition, made a lot of shots. And I was concerned because that happened in 2000, and uh, I want to say, what, 22 when Tennessee played Longwood and was like 50% from three, the next game against Michigan could, couldn't make any shots. And so that played out the same way this year when Tennessee played Texas. It's a difference, people, football fans. There's a difference between um, not making shots and playing poorly, playing bad. Tennessee did everything right except for make shots. And that's sometimes something you can't control. Like, you can control the shot selection. Like, if you're taking good shots, you're like you're playing the right way. 
if you're taking care of the basketball, you're playing the right way. If you're playing hard, you're playing the right way. If you're getting 50-50 balls and rebounding and defending, you're playing the right way. You're playing good basketball. Those are things you can control. Whether the ball decides to go into the rim, you can't control that sometimes. When you shoot the perfect shot, it rims out. And that was the case so many shots for Tennessee versus Texas. Now, Mississippi State game, there ain't no excuse for hitting the top of the backboard. Ain't no excuse for hitting the side of the backboard. Ain't no excuse for not even hitting the rim. They weren't ready to play. They weren't mentally ready to play. There's a difference. So, my football fans, I I need for you to shh sometimes. When speaking out, because you're exposing yourself of not really understanding basketball. And you're just complaining. And it, it, it's a bad look. And it's for all fans, not just Tennessee fans. Like, basketball, Tennessee did everything right except for make shots. And they took good shots. You want to take good shots. And that's what Tennessee did. Now, the offensive performance, Ben, for basketball, while having the defense that carried the team and having an offensive play late in the game to win, Reminded me of a football game within the last three years of Josh Heupel. It reminded me of a football game. A football win. What you got? Texas A&M this past season? That's a good one. What else you got? So, 2023 Texas A&M game. That's a good one. That's the first one that, that comes to mind when they really needed to lean on its defense when the offense wasn't wasn't clicking per se that's a good one w- w- were there any wins in 21 and 22 where <laughs> the offense wasn't clicking 22 with, with... i got i got one but you had a good go, one too uh because most recent my game in 22 was the pittsburgh game ah, on the road yes and re- remember how bad we were at the start of the game high throws from hendon um, couldn't get going. Had turnovers. Like it just, it just was sloppy. It was something that we didn't expect at all. And Pittsburgh was 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 offensively playing better than what we expected. Our defense kind of carried the team until the offense made a play late, and that play late was Tennessee uh, throwing the ball to Tillman Hooker, connected with Tillman there in overtime. And then Tennessee making another defensive play to seal the deal um, when their quarterback, their backup quarterback, because we knocked out their starter, uh, Keaton Slovis, but the backup quarterback um, was blitzed, threw it up because of the defensive pressure. That game reminded me so much of the Texas game this past weekend because you know, Tennessee's defense being just – suffocated Texas. I mean, their guard play uh, was was really effective. Zakai Ziegler, uh, Santiago Vescovi, Jordan Ganey, like Meshack, our guys was affecting Texas in a huge, huge way, and we were still unable to make shots. And then late, when we needed a shot from the corner, it was Josiah Jordan James and nailed the three. And then we had one three that was made by Don Connect. So, like, late in the game, you got the offense, but throughout the game, you struggled, and your defense is what was is what uh, carried you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that maybe the offense took a, a little bit longer to show up against Texas than the yeah. football team against Pittsburgh. Correct. Um, because it, it felt like the offense was, was able to get going in the second half in, in general, whereas the offense for the basketball team the other night it, it took into the last final moments of the game to get going. I mean, it, it Swain, how I, did you watch the game by yourself or, or did you have family members in the room? I know it was a late night. Um, I watched it with family members at the first part and 
second half, it was me and my oldest. Okay, and and Ace, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, happy birthday to yeah. to the goat Ace. Uh, did 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 you all have any moments looking at each other like, yeah, Tennessee's not winning this basketball game? Um, about eight minutes to go, I told my oldest, I said, I don't feel comfortable because yep. uh, we were creeping into foul trouble with putting it, putting them in a bonus. They was like cutting at the lead, one point here, one point there. Uh, it it just didn't feel right, and I was I was like, I don't know, man. But I never, I didn't I didn't think like we were gonna lose. Uh, I never had like a moment where oh god we're gonna lose this game, but I was I was concerned more and more, especially when they got into the bonus. I thought they were gonna lose that basketball game when Texas cut it to two or three, uh, because the the game was teetering, it was falling, the momentum was was falling towards Texas. They they had all the momentum, and typically, within the last couple of years when the shots have not been falling throughout the game. And when it's a defensive struggle and the other team starts to gain the momentum like Texas did late, typically it does not end up well for Tennessee in in those scenarios over the last couple of seasons. And it felt like the same old song and dance from the last couple of seasons. It, It felt like the second half of the FAU game. It felt like the second half of the Michigan game where you had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and no matter what you did, where you shot it from, how open you were, just nothing what was going in. So I, I honestly did think that Tennessee was going to lose that game just because it felt so familiar to some some recent losses over the last couple of years. Uh, but credit to Tennessee, they obviously stuck with it, and they, they made there, there's so many huge plays that they made down the stretch yep. uh, to to win that basketball game. Uh, you mentioned the Josiah Jordan James corner three. Uh, Dalton Connect had the other three in the opposite corner to finally hit one. Uh, that was his only made three of the game, and and it came at a very opportune time. Uh, but then the the free throws from Jonas Adu from Dalton Connect, and uh, that that has been a point of conversation. Not not in the sense of freaking out about the free throw shooting, but. Uh, being being concerned or, or putting a pin in it and maybe coming back and, and talking about it at a later point. And, you know, Wes Rucker and I have kind of had a running joke about how uh, Jonas Adu is the king of, of splitting free throws. And he takes that nasty fall, the second one in two games, and he splits those free throws. And then he comes back a couple of minutes later when it really, really matters most, and he knocks down both of them. At, at an absolute clutch time, and then Ga- Dalton Connect also kind of been the king of splitting free throws this season, and he steps to the free throw line and just has ice water in his veins. Two different trips where he where he made both of them, and uh, I mean th- those were critical critical shots. Whereas if if you would have told me going into the game that it was in a way going to come down to free throws from Jonas Adu and Dalton Connect, I would have been a little nervous just because. They they haven't shot as as well as they probably should have from the line this season, given how good of a shooters they are. Uh, the I don't I don't feel like their free throw percentage this season matches how good of a shooter they are. Uh, but they they made them when it mattered most. And and then I mean there's a million defensive plays that that you could talk about, but the the one that stands out to me is the Josiah Jordan James tie up, where going back to what I was talking about a moment ago when. All of the momentum seemed to be in Texas' favor. It felt like they were about to take the lead and, and kind of steal a win. Uh, Josiah Jordan James is able to come up with a defensive stop and force a tie ball that gave Tennessee the possession. And if I remember correctly, Tennessee went down and, and scored on on that next possession. Uh, so that play, and then even in, in between the Dalton Connect free throws, you were able to get a defensive stop as well. When, when it was still a three-point game, uh, you 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 had Texas in handcuffs <laughs> defensively when when it mattered most. And uh, Rick Barnes always says the one thing you can't control going into a basketball game is whether shots are going to be made or not. But the one thing you can control is how you defend and how you rebound the basketball. And Tennessee absolutely dominated Texas in that way, and they won that game because of the foundation of the program that's been built off of physicality 
and on defense. They were the better defensive team. They were the more physical basketball team. And because of that, they were able to overcome a poor shooting night and win. The last thing I'll say is, in terms of the shooting, I'm not concerned, Swain, with the shooting going forward. Uh, maybe as much as you would probably think that you need to be concerned after that type of shooting performance. Maybe I'm letting them off too easy. Uh, and I realize that there is a history shooting the basketball with this bunch, but I truly do think the vast, vast majority of the shooting struggles against Texas were a result of the Texas coaching staff, knowing the Tennessee coaching staff like the back of its hand and vice versa. I, I, I feel like the defensive stalemate, uh, the, the, the offensive struggle, the, the defensive minded game that played out. I feel like that was because both coaching staffs, really, really know each other and what they want to accomplish. And especially in that first half, Tennessee had more open looks in the second half that rimmed out. But in the first half, Tennessee was struggling, really struggling to find open, clean looks. And I felt like that was because Rodney Terry knows Rick Barnes like the back of his hand and knows exactly what Rick wants to do in different situations. The only offense that Tennessee could provide in that first half was from Tobey Awaka. And we shouldn't be talking about Tobey 21 minutes into this thing because they don't win that game without Tobey Awaka setting the tone early. But he was the only one getting clean shots in that first half. And I felt like that was a result of the coaching staff and, and the, the familiarity between both coaching staffs. Yeah, Tobey was able to establish his his dominance early uh, inside the paint, man, was 80% from the field. Uh, would have had 20-plus points if he wouldn't have fouled trouble. Um, yeah, you, you, you're right, man. Um, Tennessee was 12 for 19 on, on layups, which has to be better. Uh, you had a dunk. You had uh, four dunks on, on the night, which I thought at least two of those should have been an and one. But, God, I think we had to be better around the rim. Um, but we can, and this this is this is why people just gotta chill. Like you don't have to nitpick and analyze every little part of like the game. Guys, sports is not perfect. Like it's not perfect. You don't you don't you don't win games a hundred percent clean all the time. It's not a video game. Like you have moments whether it's in football or basketball or baseball, where it just it doesn't go according to plan. It doesn't. Well, and I, I think Walfan hits the, the nail on the head here uh, with her message, his message. I guess Walfan could be a, a, a male or a female. We don't exactly know. But uh, Walfan says that Tennessee did not let its shots not falling affect its defense, and that was the difference between that Michigan game, FAU last year, even going back to some of the recent losses going into the NCAA tournament, Kentucky, uh, Mississippi State, and Nashville at the SEC tournament. Yes, shots weren't falling, but they didn't play defense to the level they're capable of like we saw against Texas because they were letting those missed shots affect their defense. That, that's something that Rick Barnes has talked a ton about the last couple of weeks is is that again like I just said you can't control whether you make shots or not because not that shots are, are pure luck that's not the case at all there's a lot of skill to making shots and and whatnot but some of it can be bad luck I mean how, how many shots did we see in the second half from Zakai Ziegler or um, Dalton Connect especially to where it was right on line it looked good and it was it was down and out it was halfway down and it just rimmed out. I, I felt like there were several mm -hmm. of those perimeter shots from Dalton in the second half that that for whatever reason they, they just did not go down. Uh that that they typically do go down and uh instead of allowing their defense to or allowing their, their missed shots offensively uh to get them in a mental rut, they, they were able to kind of battle through that adversity and come up with huge plays on the defensive end to to make sure that they still found a way uh, to win that basketball game. And, and I think you really have to tip your hat to Rick Barnes because that's something that he's been preaching for, for years now. And I, I know some have, have been critical of that thought process uh, because it's been frustrating along the way at times. Uh, but his word proved true. And it punched the program's 10th ever ticket to the Sweet 16. And I, I 
th- there should be no complaining this time of year. W- w- when you beat a program like Texas to go to the Sweet 16, there should be no complaining because yeah. it is truly about surviving and advancing this time of year. If if you had turned in that performance against St. Peter's or Grambling or Virginia, somebody like that, then okay. I, I feel like it's maybe fair to plant a red flag uh, against some of the lesser teams in the tournament. But when when it's a, a defensive stalemate against a really solid program like Texas, there is no complaining. Yeah. And they were still able to battle through those shooting woes, Swain, and pull out the win with all the pressure in the world on them. There's more work to be done. You still got to find a way to get to the Elite Eight at minimum. Uh, I, I feel like even if you lose to Creighton, you're still coming up short. But in the meantime, acknowledging that there's still more work to do for them to get that job done and and pick up that win with all the pressure on them, with making sure they get out of the first weekend with this team, with Dalton Connect on their team against Rick Barnes and his former program, all the pressure in the world on them for for them to come through in any way possible and get that win. That that is that that's a huge huge accomplishment and a, a huge tip of the cap. Creighton is up next. A totally different basketball team in Texas. Texas is one of the best uh, teams in the, in the Big Twelve, a, a league that's right there with, with SEC as far as being deep and talented. And uh, they were battle tested from the season. It's a good win. It's always a good win, uh, but it's on the Creighton. What challenges? Will Creighton present for Tennessee? Ben McKee, Go Vols 247. I'm Jason Swain. We'll go to the Betty Chevrolet text box as well when we come back from our brief timeout. You listen to Swain Event, fueled by Daddy and Barbecue. You're listening to the Swain Event. You don't say. Fueled by Dead End Barbecue. Yeah. When you are craving some quality barbecue, there's only one place to go, Dead End Barbecue. Dead End Barbecue has been featured on ESPN's Taste of the Town, the first barbecue restaurant on the SEC Network, CBS Sports, Headline News Tailgate Show, Amazon Prime's The Restaurant Comeback, Food Paradise, and named one of the top 100 barbecue restaurants in America. The search is over. Dead End Barbecue is located on 3621 Sutherland Avenue right here in Knoxville. You can even have it delivered right to your door through Chow Now. Visit their website at deadendbbq.com. Dead End Barbecue. The search is over. Hey, Vol Nation. This is Charlie Pratt, financial representative with Modern Woodman and MWA Financial Services. Modern Woodman has been touching lives and securing futures for 140 years. Being born and raised here in East Tennessee, I'm honored to help East Tennesseans in all phases of life with retirement planning, investments, and life insurance. A big win on Saturday starts with preparation early in the week. A secure financial future starts with planning today. Contact my office today at 865-919-6468 to review your financial plan and make sure you are on track for success. As always, go Vols. Registered representative and investment advisor, representative offering securities and advisory services through NWA Financial Services, Inc., a wholly owned subsidiary of Modern Woodman of America, member of INCRA, SIPC. Good morning, Swain Event fam. America's college sports town has everything you could want in a lifestyle. You want a cottage home in town or a downtown condo? Or maybe you're looking for a home with a pool or a lake property. Well, whatever you want, the Knoxville area has it. And I'm ready to assist when it's time to find what you're looking for. So give me a call, Jennifer Morris, 865-694-5904, or email me at jennifermorris865 at gmail.com. And check out my website at nextmovesmokymountains.com. Go Vols! Betty Chevrolet saves you money. 2.9% APR or $5,000 total value on new Silverado 1500s. New Equinox with 1.9% APR plus no payments for 90 days or 2,500 total cash allowance at Baby Chevrolet. Just because you can't call in doesn't mean that you have to sit on the sideline. Impact the show with a text box. It's part of the free Swain Event app. Point event fueled by Dead End Barbecue. Looking good, Ben, in your March Madness t-shirt. 
Thank you. You you're looking good in your uh zip up Nike navy blue. Yeah, navy blue. Navy blue, man. Navy blue. Check it. I'm glad you got some souvenirs, man. Both of us are uh are wearing Creighton colors this morning. Hey man. Go blue jays, baby. Dark blue's a dark blue's a uh, popular color. And light blue's a is a nice pretty color. I uh I, I always pick up some stuff while I'm traveling. The things that I really like to collect, I like to collect uh lapel pins mm-hmm. and and magnets. That that's kind of my thing that I like to collect. Uh but this and I also like to to get a shirt but i i bought this shirt before the texas game and all the other shirt options were um they they were shirts with all the logos of the team that were in charlotte over the weekend uh so like michigan state and north carolina st peter's tennessee texas colorado state so on and so forth but i I didn't want to get a shirt uh that was all about the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. If Tennessee didn't make it out of the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. So I said, give me that, that, that bland regular old March madness blue t-shirt over there. So, uh, here we are. I, I am a big fan of it though. Uh, but the thing that I'm getting to is that I actually, you know, the little basketballs that they sell. I, uh, I, I got one for, for Knox. It, it's got like it's final four on it or whatnot. And, and he's been playing, with it like crazy, which has been fun. He he's he, we're entering the phase of of him running around and playing with baseballs and basketballs and and footballs and kind of fetch so so to speak and, and catch as as well. So that that's been a lot of fun and and he has loved his Final Four NCAA tournament basketball mini basketball that I brought back to him. So that that's been a lot of fun. NCAA appreciates your uh, contributions to their to their fund. So. Uh, You're welcome, NCAA. I know, right? Looking at Ken Palm, the, the top teams are the, the teams that are uh, alive. You know, NC State, 63, uh, according to Ken Palm. Clemson's 23. San Diego State is 17. But from 14 to, to 1, except for Auburn, those teams are still still alive, still playing. Um, Creighton is – the 11th rated team, according to Kim Palm. And this is a different challenge for Tennessee because these boys can shoot it. And they will shoot 35 threes in the game. The two losses to Providence, they shot 50% from three in both games and still lost. One game they shot literally 50%. The other game they shot 48%. But they will shoot a lot of threes. In some games, they've shot more threes than twos. And uh, I don't know which matchup I wanted more for Tennessee, Oregon, or Creighton. I I think I like this matchup because I don't see Creighton being able to straight drive the ball and penetrate to the basket versus our guards. But at the same time, we got to be really disciplined with how we defend screens, um, understanding that just because a guy is a a step and a half outside three-point line, don't get comfortable and think he won't shoot it because he will shoot that. Um, I think Cockbrenner is and can be an issue if we get in foul trouble early. Uh, He's long, he's athletic, he's, he's very skilled. He is a honorable mention All American, um, so they have some really, really good players. But they they can shoot the hell out of the ball, and if they're making making shots, then it's going to be uh, a difficult task. But again, Providence was able to beat them shooting fifty percent from three. Now they shot fifty percent from three and beat up on UConn and blew UConn out, uh, but Baylor. Um, Shireman and Ron Cockbrenner is their two their two players that are uh, recognized nationally on uh, third team All American and honorable mention. Yeah, it's going to be a tough challenge. I think Creighton is a, a very good basketball team. Uh, honestly, just very surface level thought is that I think this is 
kind of one of those games that, that's a coin flip. I, I, I could see Creighton winning. I, I could see Tennessee winning. I, I think both teams are pretty evenly matched uh, in terms of ability. They they are they they run different styles of of offense for sure. Uh, the the comparison that you hear with Creighton or for Creighton within the SEC is Alabama. That that is what Creighton is in in terms of style of offense and uh, their objective on offense. They do not like taking mid range jumpers. Yeah, uh, you, you you get in trouble very much like Nate Oates gets onto his players for taking mid range jumpers. Uh, Greg McDermott gets onto his players for taking mid <laughs> mid range jumpers. They they want to get to the rim or they want to shoot a three uh, because of the analytics and, and what the analytics say about winning games. If, if you're shooting threes or, or getting to the rim, uh, analytics say that those are uh, the, the most productive shots or, or you get the most bang for your buck with those shots. And, and Creighton tries to, to follow that just, just like Alabama does. So uh, I, I think it's a good thing Swain that, Tennessee has already matched up against a team that plays this style of of offense in Alabama. I mean, this, this, it's going to be pretty much the, the same. The personnel will obviously be different, uh, and I do feel like Creighton is more dangerous in that style of play than Alabama is because this p- particular edition of Alabama only has Mark Sears for the most part. And, and I feel like that's been a big reason why Tennessee was able to have success against Alabama – is because they were able to lock on Mark Sears and not have to worry about the others too much. Not not, not that you could leave Ryland Griffin or Aaron Estrada wide open all the time. You, you had to be conscious of, of where they were. Uh, but this Creighton team seems to have, have more weapons throughout than, than Alabama does, where Alabama seems to be a, a little bit one-dimensional uh, against elite defenses. So... I, I feel like it's a good thing that Tennessee's already run into this style of play, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I do feel like both teams are, are are pretty equal in terms of overall ability, and as silly and simplistic as it sounds, it's going to come down to who shows up and, and executes more. I mean, it, it's, it's that tight of a contested game, in, in my opinion, in, in terms of overall ability. I, I think that you would have liked to have played Oregon uh, they were the 11 seed for a reason. Creighton seed is a three seed for a reason. Uh, now that Oregon team, probably similar to Michigan a couple of years ago, or, or even this Texas team where they have more talent than their record would indicate. And they played some of its best basketball when it mattered most taking Creighton to double overtime. But obviously you would have rather played Oregon, I think just because Creighton's a better basketball team. Uh, but I, I think, both have interesting matchups in the paint uh, with, with Cockburner, as you discussed. I did have somebody who used to be around that Creighton basketball team tell me that he's very good, Cockburner is, but he's somebody who should be a a bad blankety blank, and uh, he he doesn't necessarily always play up to being that bad blankety blank. He he should have more of a aggressive. Hunter Dickinson type of attitude to him, and he sometimes lacks that. So I, I found that interesting. Mm-hmm. That would be a good matchup between him, him and a dude because that's the same thing that said about a, a dude at times. That's exactly what I thought. Uh, whereas if, if you're playing Oregon and you're having to deal with Infali Dante oh, down yeah, low he, in the post. That's why, I was, that's, why, that's why I didn't know which matchup would be best because you look at um, you know, Dante, who – Oh my gosh! Just trying to rip the dang rim down every time that he w- was dunking, um, and then you look at Jermaine, you know, Cusinart, who was the transfer from South Carolina that put up forty points versus South Carolina in the first round, and dude had all I want to say almost had thirty five shot attempts versus versus Creighton, and so but those two guys are the only ones that scored, but he's the guy that can dribble off the drive. Um, well, he can handle handle the ball. He can drive it uh, really good off the ball screen. Has a nice floater. Uh, has a three point shot. He made a couple in that game. A big one to send into overtime. Uh, he can finish around the rim. He's a three level scorer. So like he he worried me. But the more finesse game uh, of a Creighton, 
even though they don't have the athletes. Because think about we played South Carolina and how hard it was staying in front of those guards at times. Think about going up against Kentucky and how hard it was staying in front of those guards. Like Tennessee should be able to stay in front of, you know, Stephen, you know, Ashworth and you know Baylor's you know, uh, Shireman. They're good basketball players, but you should you should still be able to stay in front of those guys. And, and something that uh, Coach McDermott said during the interview, during the game, is, hey, we don't have guys that touch the top of the square. We handle the ball, we screen, we pass, we shoot. Like, we, we play a different style of ball, and it works for it works for them. They're a good basketball team. And so um, it's a different challenge, but Tennessee, with our really elite perimeter defense and guys who are laterally quick, if they ain't making a bunch of threes, Tennessee should should win this game. Yes, very much like they did the Alabama game. Yeah. Now, I I had that thought as well in, in terms of, of Tennessee being, being able to stick Creighton defensively when, when I was watching them. I, I thought to myself, okay, I, I think Tennessee is more athletic than Creighton on the perimeter, and uh, that, that should play well into Tennessee's hand. But on the other hand, and I, I quickly came back down to earth a, a little bit in that sense, because we've seen Creighton do it against really good teams mm -hmm. throughout the season. Yeah. So did it against Alabama um, this year? I, I think it's easy to to maybe look look on the surface and think, okay, well, th those dudes aren't going to be able to to blow past Jemai Meshack and Zakai Ziegler, and 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 that may prove to be the case. I, I would not at all be they surprised should. because Jemai and Zakai are elite defensively. On a quick side note, I want to throw out this stat that Rick Barnes mentioned on Vol Calls last night. Zakai Ziegler had 16 deflections in that game against Texas, uh, according to what Tennessee charts during the game. That that is that is a ridiculous amount of deflections. I mean, that 16 deflections. It, it it wasn't. I tweeted this in the first half that Zakai was being an absolute pest defensively, and that he already had two steals at the time in which I tweeted that. But it felt like he was in on so many more plays than what the stat sheet was just showing in him having those two steals and two steals only. He was an absolute pest and, and very, very annoying for that Texas offense. And, and the deflections kind of backs that up. That That's what I meant by that tweet is, is that he was deflecting passes. He, he was the, the on ball pressure, but it, it was, it was elite on top of the steals. So um, Tennessee's perimeter defense is elite and it, and it may be easy to look at the personnel that Creighton has on the perimeter as well and think, okay, well, Tennessee will lock them up. And that very that may very well be the case, but don't forget that this Creighton team has had success against some of the best teams in the country this season as well. So uh, they, they, they're probably better than, than what it may appear on the surface. Yeah, I'm not expecting Tennessee to lock Creighton up. I, I just don't uh, – I, I like the matchup with us and our guard play. Uh, defensively against against those guys, and they're going to make shots. It's really about do they make enough shots to be one point better. And if if our perimeters, uh, perimeter players, play like they're capable of playing defensively, and we make more shots than we did against Texas, and we take care of the basketball, like we forced Texas and uh, Texas, excuse me, to seventeen turnovers, but we had twelve and. That that was too many. You know, I thought Zakai was a little loose with the with the ball at times. But you mentioned his you know, sixteen BPUs, his deflections, his steals. He was able to kind of get the ball back. But if we take care of the ball and we play defense on the perimeter, like we've seen this team play all year long, and Craig is not fifty percent from from three, even though they have lost games, multiple games where they shot lights out from three, but they just couldn't get anything inside. Then, I mean, I like, I like, I like Tennessee's chances. Now it, it's going to be a close game. Um, Ken Palm has this game as a two point victory for Tennessee. I, I like, I think it's going to be a close game, but I just like, I'm not going to, I'm not saying it. We're going to lock them up. 
shut them down. I just like the matchup with our guards versus their guards on the perimeter in terms of being able to stop dribble drives. Like, that's that's what I'm saying. 865-255-03 is a number. Yeah, Creighton, Alabama play once uh, early, early in the season, like early, it was like February. And, uh, excuse me, no, that was uh, that was Creighton and UConn played in February. Creighton and Alabama played in December. And uh, Creighton won by three. You had 22 three-point attempts by Alabama, and you had 18 three-point attempts by Creighton. You're going to see a whole lot more three-point attempts from Creighton in this one. And uh, Creighton shot the ball 33% from three, and Alabama just did not make a shot. They were four for 22. So um, a lot of three-point attempts will, will, will happen, I think, on Friday, Saturday. Friday, Saturday. That's, that's when the game is. Friday, Saturday. Friday, Sunday. Well, I see what you're saying now. I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you're saying. The game will finish on Saturday morning. But yeah. if I, I thought you were Saturday. saying that. <laughs> yes, the Elite Eight game would be on Sunday, which is, I thought, what you were saying. But like I said, I misunderstood you, and I apologize for that. Uh, Rick Barnes said on Vol Calls last night that they're expecting 33s, that that they, they average around 33s. And uh, they are going to let it fly. I mean, it, it is truly uh, – the, the personnel looks different, but it, it is Alabama offensively, which, uh, like I said earlier – I think that's a great thing that Tennessee has experience going up against that style of play. And not just this season. I mean, Tennessee's been going up against that NATO offense. This core of players has been going up against that NATO offense for for several years now. So they have plenty of experience uh, going up against it. And they also have plenty of experience shutting it down. So uh, I, I, I do like this matchup for Tennessee. That, that doesn't mean it's an easy matchup or... or that it guarantees a win or anything like that because Creighton is a very, very good basketball team. They're the three seed for a reason, uh, which uh, for those keeping track at home, for those doing the math at home, that that's one seed less than, than Tennessee. Uh, so Tennessee is predicted by Kim Palm to win by two for a reason. Uh, Tennessee opened, by, opened as two-point favorites as a reason. Uh, I believe it's now up to three, uh, depending where you look. So uh, it, it's to me, it's, it's a 50-50 game, and whoever shows up and, and executes better and whoever makes more shots uh, or, or maybe not more shots, but a, a good chunk of shots. Tennessee can't have a stretch of, of shooting the basketball like it did against Texas. It, it can't, it will not win like that again. It, it's it's going to have to be, I don't know that they absolutely have to get to double digit made threes, but, but they probably need to be really, really close to, to that while limiting Creighton uh, from, from their three point shooting. So it'll be a tough matchup. It'll be a fun matchup. Uh, against two two teams that are equally as talented, in my opinion. Camden, Tennessee, Vol, Nelson from Jackson, Nathaniel, Bulldog, Brown. Got a lot of stuff here on the Betty Chevrolet text box uh, that we will get to first thing when we come back from a brief timeout. Swain Event, Fueled by Dead End Barbecue. You're listening to The Swain Event. And you know this, man. Here in Knoxville, we love it when a squirrel's in the checkerboards. But when there's a squirrel in our attic, that's all sides. When that happens, call Alpha Wildlife. They're Knoxville's veteran-owned and operated wildlife removal company. When unwanted critters put their feet up on your coffee table, call 865-224-6555. Let the Tennessee fans at Alpha Wildlife evict those unwanted tenants and set your home up with a winning defense to keep that wildlife where it belongs. That's Alpha Wildlife at 865-224-6555. They have locations in Nashville, Memphis, Chattanooga, and in parts of South Carolina. Check them out online at alphawildlife.com. Baby Chevrolet saves you money. 2.9% APR or $5,000 total value on new Silverado 1500s. New Equinox with 1.9% APR plus no payments for 90 days or 2,500 total cash allowance at Baby Chevrolet. Fellas, it's a new year. Low T Center can make it a great one. 
If you've been feeling tired and grumpy, have noticed a lack of motivation and drive, you may have low T. Low testosterone levels can cause weight gain, loss of muscle mass, and so much more. I recommend Low T Center. It's where I get my levels tested. They make it quick and easy to get your levels checked, and it's only $25. And with their on-site lab, you'll get your results back in about 25 minutes. Go to LowTCenter.com now to book your appointment online. Low T Center, reinventing men's health care. What's up, Swain Event Crew? Always happy to be with my friends in the morning. So, everybody has a next chapter in life, right? And sometimes that includes a move. Your next page may have a growing family, or maybe an empty nest, or possibly a move back home. When the time comes, I'll be here to help. Just give me a call. Jennifer Morris, Keller Williams Realty, 865 694 5904. And check out my website, nextmovesmokymountains.com. As always, go Vols! Looking for a different way to enjoy the show? Yes! Then check out Swain Event TV on YouTube. Swain Event, SwainEvent.com, fueled by Dead and Barbecue. Let's get to the phones. 865-255-03. Good morning. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Who are we speaking with today? This is VFL Swag. VFL Swag. Uh, what's what's up, VFL Swag? Uh, not much. Um, hey, Swain, do you feel this is the most consistent quarterback play that we've had, like, in practice-wise? Uh... I can't say that right now. Too early. Yeah, it's too early. I mean, I, I know um, I know what Nico um, brings to the table from an accuracy standpoint, being able to make all the yeah. throws. Um, but I think it's I think it's I think it's early. Um, I, mean, I respect that. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, been other guys that have done a good job throwing the football in practice and. Have went in the games and done the complete opposite. So I just, I, I just think it's fair to say, like we are in a good spot, and Nico's gonna look mm-hmm. good throwing the football in practice. Period, because he's right. unbelievable, and you can't hit the quarterback. Like you can't hit the quarterback, you can't come close to him. So like, he's gonna throw right. the ball great in practice. But, uh, but yeah, I'm I'm proud of uh, the men's basketball, but. Uh, I just wanted to say go Vols, and y'all have a wonderful day. All right. Appreciate the phone call there. Andy, 865-255-03. Uh, oh, boy. I'm going to text him about this. All right. Let me, let me go from the top to the bottom. A P D thirteen. I've seen a lot about whether Kelly should be back. One argument on lack of recruiting was lack of NIL for the Lady Vols. I don't feel that's true thoughts. Um I'm not gonna get into the weeds here on this. I will say that recruiting should not be a problem at the University of Tennessee when it comes to Lady Falls. And if it is a problem, then you need to do something about it. It's pretty simple. Like Tennessee football, Lady Vol basketball should not have problems recruiting. And if it is problems recruiting, it's the support around them. It's the coach. It's the collection of assistants. Like that should not be a problem. Nate Thames says they're Alabama on offense, but their defense is a whole lot better than Alabama's talking about Creighton. I agree with that, Nate Daniel. Uh, Camden Tennessee Vol says, I went to games in Memphis this past weekend. That Houston defense is um, impressive live. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Very athletic. Stingy, tough. Man, they are fortunate to get out of that game versus Texas A&M, man. Wade Taylor the fourth couldn't, couldn't make anything. They had multiple players file out, and Jamal Shedd was, was the guy that had to bail – Houston out, but that's why he's All-American, man. That's why he's the best two-way point guard in America. 
And Zakai is a tick under Jamal Shed. Like Shed is is just he he's special. I didn't I didn't know who that was that put that dump back until he came down. I was like, wait a minute, he he's shorter than everybody else. That can't be Shed. Like he dunked on everybody. That was a that was a great game. But I'm a I'm a fan of uh Texas A and M's basketball program and how they play, man. I got a lot of respect for how Buzz Williams run his program and took how how his players play and how tough they are. Uh, that was a really good game. Uh, 865 Nelson for Jackson says, why does Coach LB recruit guys that don't play center in high school and move them to center once they get to campus versus recruiting guys that actually play that position? My guess is you feel like that's something that you can teach a player to do. It's harder to recruit a center, have him to play guard or tackle, rather than recruiting a dude that guard or tackle that you know they can move people that have the fundamentals, and you feel like you can you can teach them how to snap the football. Like, I don't think Ollie Lane was terrible at snapping. It wasn't like he was a great guard. And then because he was playing center, he wasn't great. Like, Ali was struggling to play guard because physically he he just – he's not like a typical four- or five-star player that plays in SEC. He did his best. Um, but Ali was able to play center with a couple weeks of, of – probably not even that – of preparation – when Mays wasn't going to be available to begin the season with his surgery. So, Nelson, I would say because they feel comfortable, Ellaby feels comfortable being able to convert a guard or tackle to center. I also wonder how many high school linemen that are able to play at this level are playing center in high school. I, I feel like most of the the talented linemen that, that can play at this level, I mean, you look at, I know guards different than center, obviously, but like all of the guards that that have come into Tennessee in recent years, they were tackle in high school. And they, they, don't, they don't typically play the position that they're going to play in college in high school unless they are a bona fide offensive tackle. So maybe I'm just pulling something off the top of my head and, and it's meaningless, but no, I, think I, 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 right. I would wonder how many linemen that can play at this high of a level actually play center in high school. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like your best athlete, the best player, you're going to put him probably at the most valuable position. So how many times have we seen the best athlete play running back for their school or play quarterback for their school because you want to put the ball in their hands? Um, you know, you take a Jawan Jennings, like he's playing quarterback for his high school because he's you want the best athlete with the ball in his hands the majority of the time. But his best position in college was to to play receiver or to play safety, and he settled on receiver. It's no different than um, taking one of your really good players that's going to play receiver at the next level, but he's playing running back for his high school team. That was the case with Robert Meacham. If you don't have a quarterback that can throw him the ball, why would you put him at receiver in high school and never get him the ball? Well, you put him at running back. Get him the ball every time if you want to. So I think that's a really good point by you. I think if you are a really good lineman, we're going to put you at center. If you're the best lineman on the team and you have the ability to protect the quarterback's blind side, yeah, we're, gonna, we're probably going to put you at tackle rather than put you at center. So uh, all I know is – what happened last year happened last year, and it was an unfortunate situation. It was obviously a mistake of not planning, and if you're LLB company, you can't let it happen again. Like, you can't ha- you can't let it happen again, period, point blank. You're making almost a million dollars to make sure that the offensive line is good, and you can't let that happen by – not planning for the future. Don't raise your eyebrows all sideways. It's the truth. 
I, I know it's true, but that, that doesn't mean that it still won't get a reaction out of me. But you, you, you are spot on, obviously. I ain't, be, I, mean, I, ain't, I ain't being mean about it. I'm just, I, I mean, past this year, past this season, and uh, there's no need to talk about the 2025 season on March 26th. But yeah. in terms of offensive line development and looking to the future and a third season with Nico Iamaliava at quarterback, who do you have coming back next season for for 2025 that you know you can count on? I mean, right right now it's Lance Hurd, and technically Lance Hurd hasn't even played a, a snap of football for you. Hey, better figure it out. That's all. That's all. That's all I can say. Figure it out. Figure it out. You're Tennessee. You got support. You can figure it out. Uh, how about Bulldog Brian coming in here with some? Diamond Vols coming into town this weekend, riding some hot bats. I want to know why players down in Georgia riding so dirty. Why can, can we get y'all to 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 obey the rules when in a vehicle? Why? What, I don't understand what's going on in Georgia. He didn't have any problems at all when he was at Florida. Etn he gets to Georgia now he's getting arrested operating a, a vehicle. I don't understand what is going on at this. But anyways. Charlie Condon is leading all the NCAA with 17 home runs and a 5-1-7 bat average. Well, let me introduce you to a gentleman that we just pulled from Clemson. His name is Billy Amy. What what you got to say about Billy Amy, Bill McGee? Well, I I, I don't have good news on Billy Amy, so maybe slide your your baseball cup in for, for a moment. Uh, I, I don't know that Billy's going to be able to play this weekend against Georgia. Uh, Tony Vitello said last night on Vol Calls that he has had something uh, pop up uh, since this past weekend, which is only a short amount of time. I mean, Tony said this on, on Monday night around 8.30, okay. and Tennessee picked up a series win over Ole Miss in which Billy hit a grand slam in the game to bring the run rule into effect. That game ended at about 3 to 3.30. So, uh, Billy dealing with some bad luck in terms of of a medical situation popping up between the end of of the Ole Miss game and last night on Vol Calls. And it's nothing crazy serious. It's it's just unfortunate timing uh, more than anything. Tony Vitello said that that they're probably going to have to figure out how to win a game or two without Billy. Uh, I, I think he could miss potentially up to a week or two. Uh, nothing much more than that. Again, not, more nothing. Than, not more a than one or two games. Injury. No, uh, but of, of course Tony's not going to say that on on vol calls. But I I I would be surprised if if Billy plays this weekend against Georgia. Again, nothing serious. Uh, there are that there are medical situations that everybody deals with throughout life. Uh, like wisdom teeth, that is an unfortunate medical situation that a lot of people have to tend to. I'm not saying that Billy had his wisdom teeth pulled out, but it, it was something kind of along those lines that popped up out of the blue, needed to be taken care of, and uh, I, I would be surprised if if we saw him play this weekend uh, against uh, Georgia. I, I I don't know what I can and can't say because it's not my body that, that had a procedure, so I'm trying to tiptoe around it, but... Um, I, I would be surprised, based off of what I have heard, if 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 Billy played this weekend against Georgia, which would be unfortunate if that proves to be the case, uh, because Charlie Condon, as Bulldog Brian points out, is on, on an absolute tear. He is the best player in college baseball this season, uh, the third baseman for Georgia. Uh, as Bulldog Brian mentioned, 17 home runs already before we even get to April is ridiculous. He He's tracking to be... Uh, the number one overall pick in the draft, I feel like. If if he can keep this pace up, he is starting to, to gain steam. And uh, Wes Johnson, the former LSU pitching coach who has taken over as the Georgia head coach, uh, has really rejuvenated that Georgia baseball program that I feel is a sleeping giant. If Georgia ever decides to care about baseball, the rest of the SEC is going to be in trouble because th- there's no reason, given the amount of baseball talent, in the state of Georgia, for the Georgia Bulldogs to struggle on the diamond inconsistently. 
Uh, so they, they are playing really, really well. They're on the verge of, of being a ranked baseball team. Uh, Tennessee lost at Alabama two weekends ago, and then Alabama went to Georgia this past weekend and got swept by Georgia. So uh, Tennessee is going to have its hands full this weekend, and unfortunately they're battling the injury bug as well. I mentioned the thing with Billy that he's got going on. Uh, hopefully it is only a game or two, uh, as Tony mentioned on Vol Calls, but uh, I have a I, I, I would kind of be surprised if, if he plays a ton this weekend, if if at all, and, and that's obviously a big loss, your, your three-hole hitter. Uh, the good news is that you have plenty of offense. The, the questions, as uh, Brian Hunsucker asked on the text box, is about the pitching. Uh, A.J. Russell, uh, that, that situation doesn't seem to be in a great spot. Uh, he, he just cannot shake the the tightness in his forearm, uh, the, the soreness w- within his armpit that he had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he, he has just not been able to feel like himself, and he had to come out of Saturday's game early in the eighth inning and was kind of shaking his hand and was acting as if he didn't have feeling in his hand, and, and that's typically not a great sign. So from my understanding, they were still doing testing yesterday and, and possibly today as as well, but uh, that that that's concerning, and, and I, I'm nervous about how that situation is going to play out, and, and that would just be a huge loss. I, I think you had me on Josh and Swain right before the season, Swain, and and you asked me, like, who is the player that Tennessee can't lose? And I, I said A.J. Russell. A.J. Russell or Drew Bean, because th- there's already question marks around the depth of this pitching staff, and A.J. Russell is one of the best pitchers in the country. Tennessee can cannot afford to lose him. And uh, hopefully it's it, it's not as serious as, as maybe some of the signs are, are indicating, but, but even if you avoid – a major injury he, he's still probably going to have to miss some time so uh, you, you're dealing with that Marcus Phillips is, is trying to get going Tennessee needs him to get going Tony did say on Vol calls the, the one positive bit of injury news is is that he thinks that Marcus Phillips uh, will be available to pitch tonight when they play Tennessee Tech so uh, they're, they're kind of dealing with the injury bug right now Don Bargo is dealing with a hamstring that's a bat that they want in the lineup um, but and, and they've got their hands full in the meantime because you you've got that Georgia team I talked about coming to town this weekend. Next weekend, you go to to Auburn, who's a fringe top 25 team and a team that, that can compete to go to Omaha. And then LSU's coming to town the next weekend for the spring game. So uh, they, they need to get healthy as quick as they can because they, they are they are entering the gauntlet of SEC play. Well, Hunter wants to know about the management uh, of the pitching staff. He feels like guys are being left in a little too long. Yeah, I mean that that that's always been the topic of conversation or or the the nitpick with Tony uh during his tenure uh, whether or not he leaves pitchers in too long at times which uh I I I certainly think that there is something to be said for that. I I think that 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 is a fair criticism at times. I I, I think it boils down to we, we all know that one of the things that makes Tony Vitello so great is how loyal he is. He he is loyal to his guys. He he's gonna ride with what he knows. He he's going to to lean on his his trust, what he trusts, and, and he's gonna ride with it. And, and I I feel like that's maybe where keeping guys in too long stems from at times is is just having a ton of belief in in, in his guys and, and maybe trusting that that they're gonna work their way out of it. And, and so sometimes that comes back to bite him in the butt. But also like. There's times where he, like, a pitcher could be facing the second batter he's facing in the game, and and Tony goes out there with a 2-0 count and, and pulls them uh, as well. So it, it it's all situational. It, it did seem like maybe A.J. Russell was left in there a little bit too long on, on Saturday, if that's what Brian Hunsucker uh, was referring to. But I, I think that Tony just has a lot of trust and belief in his guys to to, to try and work themselves out of jams and, uh, tr- tries to allow them the opportunity to do so. Rodney says heading up to watch the game with his dad. Hopefully, does not get rained out. Eight six five two hundred fifty five zero three. Take our last time out uh, of the day here on the Swain event. Ben McKee, Go Boss, Super Seven. I'm Jason Swain. Stay with us.
What's up, Swain Event family? It's great to be on board. This is Taylor Hawkins with Modern Woodman Fraternal Financial, and I have one question for you. When was the last time you have slowed down and evaluated your financial situation? Just like the Vols, a great game plan leads to victory. Let us help you achieve your financial goals with a custom-made game plan. No matter what stage of life you're in, protecting your family and hard-earned money is important. So let one of our local and trusted financial professionals secure your future by visiting one of our 10 branch offices across Tennessee or give us a call locally at 865-312-5638. And remember, go Vols. Registered representative and investment advisor, representative offering securities and advisory services through NWA Financial Services, Inc., a wholly owned subsidiary of Modern Woodmen of America, member of INCRA, SIPC. Here in Knoxville, we love it when a squirrel's in the checkerboards. But when there's a squirrel in our attic, that's all sides. When that happens, call Alpha Wildlife. They're Knoxville's veteran-owned and operated wildlife removal company. When unwanted critters put their feet up on your coffee table, call 865-224-6555. Let the Tennessee fans at Alpha Wildlife evict those unwanted tenants and set your home up with a winning defense to keep that wildlife where it belongs. That's Alpha Wildlife at 865-224-6555. They have locations in Nashville, Memphis, Chattanooga, and in parts of South Carolina. Check them out online at alphawildlife.com. When you are craving some quality barbecue, there's only one place to go, Dead End Barbecue. Dead End Barbecue has been featured on ESPN's Taste of the Town, the first barbecue restaurant on the SEC Network, CBS Sports, Headline News Tailgate Show, Amazon Prime's The Restaurant Comeback, Food Paradise, and named one of the top 100 barbecue restaurants in America. The search is over. Dead End Barbecue is located on 3621 Sutherland Avenue right here in Knoxville. You can even have it delivered right to your door through Chow Now. Visit their website at deadendbbq.com. Dead End Barbecue. The search is over. Fellas, it's a new year. Low T Center can make it a great one. If you've been feeling tired and grumpy, have noticed a lack of motivation and drive, you may have low T. Low testosterone levels can cause weight gain, loss of muscle mass, and so much more. I recommend Low T Center. It's where I get my levels tested. They make it quick and easy to get your levels checked, and it's only $25. And with their on-site lab, you'll get your results back in about 25 minutes. Go to LowTCenter.com now to book your appointment online. Low T Center, reinventing men's health care. Good morning, Swain Event fam. America's college sports town has everything you could want in a lifestyle. You want a cottage home in town or a downtown condo? Or maybe you're looking for a home with a pool or a lake property? Well, whatever you want, the Knoxville area has it. And I'm ready to assist when it's time to find what you're looking for. So give me a call, Jennifer Morris, 865-694-5904. Or email me at jennifermorris865 at gmail.com. And check out my website at nextmovesmokymountains.com. Go Vols! The conversation doesn't stop when the show is over. Follow the Swain event on Twitter and like this show on Facebook. Swain event fuel by Dead Barbecue. Let's get to the phone lines. 865 And uh, good morning. Who do we have with us? Good morning, fellas. It's DZ in Milwaukee. How we doing? What How up, DZ? Man, I'm chilling. I done missed most of the show this morning, but I definitely wanted to call in and catch y'all before uh, before the show ended. Um, very, 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 very proud of our walls so far. Um, very excited for Friday. Um, I feel like Creighton, um, good team, good shooting team. Um, I actually got to watch them play against Marquette um, a couple months ago here in Milwaukee. And... Um, a little soft. Um, I'm not going to say um, that we're going to bully them or beat them up or anything like that because they are definitely talented, but uh, they can be had. Um, I'm hoping that um, Rick's been on the phone with Kim English Near enough. since um, since Saturday. I'm pretty sure he has. And um, I'm sure the game plan is getting worked out. And like I said, I'm really excited for Friday. Yeah, we'll uh... – We'll talk to Rick Barnes on Joshua Swain today uh, around 2.15, not 2.15, but 12.15, excuse me, 12.15. And um, that's that's one thing. Definitely got to ask him about, you know, his connection with the Kim English and the fact that Providence beat them twice um, if, if they spoke it or whatever. Uh, if, if 
the game is officiated the easy the way it's been officiated so far in the tournament. Like it favors Tennessee because it's been it's been physical, man. That A and M uh, Houston game that was a bloodbath. I mean, it was bodies all over the ground. Uh, it seemed like every possession. So if they're allowing guys to be physical, I think that favors Tennessee, who wants to be physical. Yeah, I agree. I know one of the pundits um, that was previewing the game yesterday was uh, telling us to get ready for a rock fight um, just because, you know, they know how we play, how physical of a style of basketball that we play. And, you know, Creighton is, you know, they're a good shooting team, but I'm, um, and they, they actually have a pretty good defense as well. Not, you know, not quite our caliber, but um, I guess from the, the metrics or whatever, they are pretty decent as well. But, I'm not sure that they've seen um, the physicality that our guys are hopefully going to be able to bring on Friday, especially Jonas. That's the that's the key matchup for me. Um, I think it kind of sticks out like a, a sore thumb is Clark Brenner against Jonas. If, um, if we can get that fire out of Jonas on Friday, uh, I think we'll be fine. Man, go dunk. Go dunk on people, man. Don't be laying Please. that ball up. Go dunk on people. Go through their face. Please. Um, I'm not sure if you guys saw after um, after the Texas game, Candace and uh, Jay Wright um, made some great points about Creighton's defense, um, mm-hmm. how they were um, the covering or how they were guarding in the paint. And that that could be um, a spot that we can definitely expose, especially, you know, with Jonas and um, the way Kobe Kobe was looking like that uh, that first Kentucky game again. (laughs) I don't (laughs) know why Kobe was looking like that, man. It was a foul. Well, you you know, Kobe, I'm sure he doesn't think he ever fouls. And we know (laughs) he probably probably gives away with a foul on every possession, but can kind of, you know, maneuver his way out of it. But. I just love the effort. Yep. Um, that boy Jordan Ganey definitely gave his all for Tennessee Man, um, on Saturday. That was his best game by far. I don't care about points or anything else. That dude was everywhere. Yeah, had the uh, second best plus minus on the team uh, behind Josiah yeah, Jordan cool. James. But, but he defended his he defended his butt off. Go ahead, Ben. Had that, yeah, had, sorry for cutting you off there. Had, had that rebound where he stole the ball away from – uh, Mr. Dirty Player, Brock Cunningham, and, and then had to play on, on the baseline where he saved the, the basketball from from going out of bounds. He he also was a pest defensively. I, I completely agree with you where uh, maybe they have the points that, that you would like to see from him or, or we're accustomed to seeing from him, but his uh, his defense and, and the, the hustle plays, the winning plays, far made up for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I just well, one more quick point, and then um, I'll let you guys get off. And then obviously, I'm gonna need to rewind and <laughs> start the show from the beginning. But uh, I hate I missed you guys a couple weeks ago. Yeah, no. um, I definitely try my best to, to get back down there as soon as possible. Um, ben, as far as um, Cannon, so at least that weekend, Cannon. his walk up song was Akon Locked Up. I'm not sure if it's still the same or if you remember. It's not. It's not that anymore. Okay. What we do? No. He uh he has a uh, solo by Future right now, which is a great song, one of my favorite yes, songs, is. and yes, it's it uh it, it it's in my I have a a pair of playlists on, on my Spotify. One with with all my songs in it, and then one like to where if I want to listen to my favorite songs, that's the playlist I play. Uh, and, and solo by Future is on my my top playlist. But uh, I I asked him. I've been waiting on you to call in and ask. I I asked him uh, after after a game when he was doing a post game press conference. I, I said one. I had to inform him about the whole Cannon Cannon the producer. I, I I had to say something to him, and and then he he claimed that he remembered what I was talking about. How that used to be a thing, uh, and then I said, okay, well then why don't you include that in your walk up song? And he said because they don't play my walk up song long enough. So. Uh, I I I did pass it along for y'all, and I I asked, yeah. but uh, the the answer was no because the the walk up song does not play long enough. I got the I got the perfect song that it would it would say canon, and the beat drops and it's perfect. Oh man, um, 
God, what's the name of that song? I'll I'll I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, so you don't show. got it. Well, I'll have it right now. <laughs> I think I want to say it's uh yeah, I'll send it to you after the show. Yeah, I'll have it right now. I'm sure you'll talk to Cannon Peebles on the locker room at some point, so you you, you can pass it along to him then. All right. We'll do that, man. Yeah. Hey, hey, DZ, thanks, man. Thanks for the phone call. Oh, yeah, always. You got that um, all about the Benjamins, uh, P. Diddy playlist on you. Anyways, let me go to the text box. Trey Lipska Bay make the Nets, Nets opening roster debate in D.C. about whether or not that is the best move for his future. Some people think even though he's kicked butt in spring training that it would be bad to rush him up so soon. Thoughts? You got any thoughts there, Ben? Um, not a ton. I obviously haven't been able to watch a, a ton of spring training. I, I know Trey Lipscomb uh, has been performing well. Jordan Beck just won the Rockies award for spring training MVP. Uh, a, a lot of former Vols from the Tony Vitello era are, are showing out professionally right now. Garrett Crochet is going to be the opening day pitcher for the Chicago White Sox. Jason Swain's Chicago White Sox. So uh, that that is, uh, that's really cool to see. Uh, so I, I don't have any, obviously there's a lot going on with Tennessee basketball right now and, and trying to keep up with Tennessee baseball and, and spring training. I, I haven't paid attention in depth uh, to the Trey Lipscomb situation. I, I do think the one benefit if you do start him out in the big leagues is that he is an older guy, obviously, because he did play three years of, of college. Uh, so, and knowing Trey personally, he's very mature and uh, as cool as the other side of the pillow, he, he does not get rattled. Uh, so I, I don't think the moment would be too big for him at all. But in terms of the stunting development conversation, that is absolutely a real possibility. It, it's just different. The major leagues are, are just different, as you know, Vol fan, and as so many who follow baseball knows, it's, it's different than double A AA and triple A. And, and he has been going up against uh, major league pitchers during spring training. Uh, but to do it, game in and game out because even though you're going up against major league pitching and, and spring training, there, there's still some, some guys who are going to start out in the minor leagues mixed in. Whereas once you get into the regular season, it, it's big league arm after big league arm after big league arm. And uh, they identify any and all holes in your swing and they attack, attack, attack those holes uh, until you correct those mistakes. Uh, so only the nationals know whether Trey Lipscomb is in a, in a comfortable spot to be able to adjust to that and, and be prepared for that. And and I, I certainly hope that they make the right decision because uh, Trey, Trey is as good as they come and he has a lot of potential and, and I would hate to see his uh, career get thrown off track because they rush him to the big leagues. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just a matter of time before he and Drew Gilbert are, are playing in the same division against each other. And, and that's going to be fun to watch 20 to 30 times a year and, uh, very, very excited for Trey and, and what he's about to do because it, it well, even if he starts in the minor leagues, which would not be a bad thing because he can continue to develop and, and maybe not get thrown off track. Uh, it, it's only a matter of time before he makes his way up to DC and, and is playing in the big leagues near his hometown. All right, let's get to the phones. 865-255-03. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Who are we speaking with today? Gene. What's up, Gene? Hey, we're doing well. My favorite part of the ball game was, after the dirty play, <laughs> was that nice little grin that Ganey had behind him, like, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> foul. Gotcha. Flagrant foul one, gotcha. My, my favorite part was when uh, Jonas Adu offered some instant karma. <laughs> got a question for Ben. What you got? Baseball question. Who's, who's going to end up with a, with a home run record? It was It was – thought that like a predetermined thing that it was going to be Blake Burke, but then Seymour said, hold my daddy hat. He's yeah. only one behind him. Yeah. And, and Simo should have received more recognition for that going into the season. Uh, obviously Blake Burke is viewed as more of a home run hitter because he's a big burly first baseman. Um, but it, it's, it's really fun and really cool to, to see it play out in, in front of our eyes. I think there's going to be a lot of, 
uh, Luke Lipsius and, and Evan Russell down the stretch in the sense that uh, if you remember in that NCAA tournament, they one guy would hit one to break the record or tie the record, and, yeah, and then the other guy, w- yeah, they'd yeah. go back and forth. So I, I feel like Burke and Simo, uh, if if they can avoid a hitting slump, then uh, I feel like there's going to be a lot of back and forth trying to come out on top with that home run record. But it, it, it's a lot of fun. Simo is absolutely on fire right now. I, I know it's Billy Amick gets a lot of gets a lot of talk, um, but I, I think Simo is Tennessee's most complete hitter and, and best hitter. And, and you're splitting hairs. Uh, Billy Amick and Christian Moore at the end of the day are, are professional hitters playing college baseball. Uh, Blake Burke falls into that category Blake as well. Doing a lot better. Uh, he's flattened his swing out a little bit, it seems. Yes, yeah, he, he's not thinking as much. Uh, he's not thinking as much. He, he's trusting his work. He has a ton of confidence. Uh, and, and his biggest problem, you, you've heard Tony Vitello talk about it a lot, um, is that if you go back and watch his freshman and sophomore years, when he would get himself in trouble, he would he would be running at the baseball as if he is a slap hitter in softball. And he wouldn't just kind of stick in there and, and trust his swing and have confidence. He, he was running at the baseball because his, his mind was tied up into a pretzel. And uh, he's been able to get away from that and, and really stay in his legs. That generates all that power. And uh, he, he is if, – if you want to know whether a baseball player is locked in at the plate or not, watch where their hits are going. And if they're spraying to all parts of the field, if if they're going the opposite way, if if, the, if a left-hander is going to left field, if a right-hander is going to right field the opposite way, their swing is in a great place. And uh, Blake Burke, I mean, he is spraying the baseball to all gaps. He, he's doubling down the left field line. He's doubling the left center. Uh, he's pulling the ball, and, and he's just – he's absolutely on fire right now at the plate. And uh, th- there there are some concerns with, with the pitching staff and, and the pitching depth, uh, but the offense is, is good enough to potentially overcome that lack of pitching depth at the moment until Frank Anderson sprinkles his pixie dust and, and gets the pitching staff going. But <laughs> – uh, yeah, that that's a fun race to, to watch right now. Simo and, and Burt going back and forth. They they are professional hitters playing college baseball right now, and it's a lot of fun to watch. I always know when he's done something well because his mom's on my Twitter or X or whatever you call it. And it's, There's my baby. <laughs> yeah, Mama, Mama Burke is is awesome. That that's a a real fun family, uh, California family that has really adopted Knox. So that that's been a fun story the last couple of years, and and they're very very proud of Blake, and rightfully so. Hey, thank you, Gene, man. Good to hear from you, buddy. Have a good day, guys. All right, you too. All right, tomorrow. I have, I have a question for you. All right, go ahead. What do you think of the new uh, kickoff rule in the NFL that just passed? The uh, the the UFL kickoff where I don't know exactly the yard line where the kickoff team, covers team, and return team players will start. It looks like it's on about the 30 or the 35, and – uh and, and the the kick returner is in his normal spot, and and the kicker is in his normal spot. But just the the coverage teams and they they are lined up closer to the kick returner, and and it seems like it's it's going to create more opportunities for kickoff returns in in the game, which is a great thing for the game because you you need that that's one of the most exciting plays in sports is a kickoff return for a touchdown or a big kickoff return. I mean, how how many times did Evan Berry ignite Neyland Stadium with a big kickoff return? or uh, Cordero Patterson, they, they need more of that in the game, not less of it. And it seems like this is going to help there be more of it while also theoretically limiting injuries because they're not running so far and, and just colliding with, with head-on collisions. I mean, that rule makes more sense than banning the, 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 the hip drop. Like, what are we doing? I mean, how are you supposed to tackle someone that's out in front of you? You're supposed to just let them go? Supposed to dive at their their ankles and hope to tackle them. Um, football is a violent game, and I think you've eliminated as many tackles as you could from the game. You eliminated the horse collar, which you know we've seen Terrell Owens that injury um, affect him, and that's the reason why the rules changed. We've seen helmet to helmet. You got rid of that hit, hip drop. I mean, I I don't know how you how you play defense, how you tackle. Uh, so that rule makes more sense than than the hip drop, but yeah, I, I like it. I like it. Tomorrow, uh, Tennessee will hit their first scrimmage, 
And also tomorrow you have you have pro day. This is very very important for guys like Joe Milton and Jamal Hatton and, and Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright's put himself in position to be first back off the board almost. I mean, you look at B. John Robinson's numbers at Texas this last year before entering the draft. You look at Jalen Wright's numbers this last year, this last year, and man, they're very very similar. And Jalen Wright possesses that explosiveness that teams are looking looking at. He's a every down back. He's a guy that can catch the ball in the backfield. Uh, I'm so happy that, that Wright's in this position, man. All the work that he's put in. And I remember how hurt he was after that Purdue game, man. He he that he was hurt, man. He was hurt. Uh losing that game and have an opportunity to get to the end zone and win but but falling short. That drove him and motivated him and man, he's in a great position right now. And so those guys have an opportunity to make some some money in pro day, but tomorrow